Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the 98th episode of the Royal Society of Medicine's COVID-19 series, an update on therapeutics. My name is Melita Irving. I am a trustee of the Royal Society of Medicine and past president of the medical genetics section. Um, now, before we start, I just wanted to signpost you to an event we have on the 31st of March. Um, we're hosting our COVID conference two years on, um, which is the 100th episode of the COVID series. Um, we'll be featuring um, illustrious guests such as Professor Sir Chris Whitty and Professor Sir Jonathan Van Tam. Um, and we'll be discussing two years, two whole years of the, of the pandemic and the future of COVID. Um, so tickets for that are available on the RSM website on the homepage. Um, and uh, so, yes, do check that out. That's going to be a very um, um, uh, um, interesting um, uh, event on that day. Um, now back to today's event. Well, this is um, um, the um, an update uh, about the available COVID-19 treatments for hospitalized and for non-hospitalized patients and the trials that are currently underway. So I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. We have three of them. Professor Sir Chris Butler, Professor of Primary Care at the University of Oxford and Co-Chief Investigator of the Panoramic Study and Principal Trial. Professor Manu Shankahari, Chair of Translational Critical Care Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. And to Dr. Stephen Griffin, a uh, virologist at the University of Leeds. So um, welcome to you all. And um, thank you for finding the time to, 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 to do this with us today. Um, so Chris, if I might start with you, um, do you think you might give us an overview of, of what's happening in terms of developments in therapeutics in the community in the, in the primary care setting? Thanks, Milita. Um, I think you might have just uh, inadvertently um, knighted me in the introduction, which uh, <laughs> is, def is, is definitely not the case. It's an omen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think we're a long way from that. But uh, yes, I think that, that sort of um, moment has happened whereby early treatments, therapeutics for the for, for COVID-19, for early use in the community, in, in the illness, is, is kind of, in my view, the next frontier for COVID research. I mean, we've had these groundbreaking massive trials of therapeutics for the very sick in the hospital, which have saved many lives. But I think ultimately the goal is to prevent people from becoming eligible to trials like recovery or remap cap and so forth. And uh, the reach and impact of drugs taken really early is, is, is the next exciting frontier. And so hence moving at pace to uh, establish and implement trials like that. Um, I, I think that there are new exciting antivirals which uh, are specific to COVID coming down the pipeline already in uh, with conditional marketing authorization here. And so the emphasis within that space is shifting from trying to find a repurposed licensed drug for COVID to um, evaluating the place of these uh, novel uh, COVID specific uh, antivirals. So it's, it's a very exciting time, uh, probably a bit, a bit late to be doing this, but uh, better late than never. Um, and, you know, a lot of people might be asking, why do you need trials when there are um, already uh, efficacy studies out about these trials? And um, I think the le reason we need large scale pragmatic trials is that there's no ways we're ever going to give these drugs to everybody with a positive test. And we have to figure out who we can safely uh, uh, not treat and who has a good chance of benefiting from them. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And we'll, we'll come on to a bit more detail around that and some of the results of the panoramic and of the principal um, study and trial in, in a moment. Um, but if I could just bring um, Stephen in here. Um, so St Stephen, what is happening with the virus right now? Uh, are, we, are we ahead of it? Is it ahead of us in terms of the treatments that we're developing? Well, I think in terms of the, the treatments that we're using and, have, and are now rolling out in trials, um, the virus isn't going to really start changing particularly until we start using these, these, these therapies en masse in a, in a wider spectrum. There, there are evidences of, of certainly some changes in respect to remdesivir therapy, for example, 
Um, and of course, the monoclonal antibodies may be driving changes, but whether or not those changes that happen in people that are treated are then able to be viable and spread throughout the community is, is something that we need to look at very carefully and we need to keep monitoring. So surveillance in combination with trials is going to be really important going forward, definitely. So these are good changes, are they? That, uh, uh, can we compare this with, with uh, antibiotic resistance, which are often bad changes or... Well, no, these, these would be unfortunate changes, I'm afraid. So, so things that would perhaps prevent the binding of remdesivir into the active site of the polymerase, for example. We already see changes in, in spike that are happening randomly in nature because it's a similar um, evolutionary pressure that, that would happen um, against the monoclonal therapeutics. Um, so things like Ronoprev, for example, we can't use for Omicron because it's, it's, there are changes in, in the spike protein that prevent those highly efficient binding of those antibody combinations. Um, so we need to keep an eye on that. We need to make sure that we have the surveillance globally to understand what strains of the virus are present. And, and in terms of, you know, as, as Chris said, picking the correct patients that will benefit. So you, if you're going to use these sorts of therapies, you need to make sure that the virus is going to be susceptible. And we also need to apply the therapies properly. And um, it's, it's going to be, remain to be seen whether or not we need things like drug combinations to, to keep resistance down and, and, and things like that going forwards. Certainly, I don't think we have enough at the moment. We need to continue developing new therapeutics, targeting the virus, definitely. And yeah, you make a good point about surveillance and our testing strategy nationally has changed recently. So maybe we'll come on and talk about that a little a bit, a little bit more in a moment. And just a reminder to everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A. And if you like anybody else's question, please upvote it and we'll prioritise it for you. Um, so, so Manny, could I bring you in now? Um, just to, in, in view of what Stephen has said and what Chris has said, it, what's your viewpoint from the um, from the intensive care setting, from the from the hospital from the hospital setting? Yeah, uh, Melita, thanks and thanks to the RSM for the invitation and the opportunity. I just want to take one minute to just to kind of acknowledge my fund, uh, NIHR. Um, do fund a lot of my research, and therefore these are my views, not necessarily of the NIHR or the Department of Health of the NHS. Um, so I, I, for, the, for, for the intro bit of this, probably I want to kind of highlight the WHO living um, guidelines. And these are published within the BMJ, and, uh, and it's an iterative process. Whenever new evidence comes in, the WHO kind of prioritizes and selects uh, evidence to look at. And then there's a global panel that uh, provides the recommendations for different drugs. And within the WHO guidelines, we have three grades of severity of the disease in hospitalized patients. One is the most severe form, which is the critically ill patients who require life support. And then there is this um, severe form, which are patients who are hospitalized and require oxygen therapy to keep their respiratory, uh, res to provide respiratory support because their saturation levels are less than 90% on room air. And they have some degree of respiratory distress with evidence of pneumonia. And then there are patients who are hospitalized, not necessarily meeting that criteria. So if we take that those three groups, the WHO guidelines then go on to look at uh, providing recommendations for treatments for these three groups. And the recommendations and treatments are fairly uh, simply divided into strong recommendations in favor, strong recommendations against, and then there's this conditional or the weak recommendations where the evidence isn't strong across the particular population. So if we look at the strong recommendations in favor, um, currently for a severe and critical disease, uh, the recommended therapy is corticosteroids at the time of admission. The second recommended therapy in that population is interleukin-6 receptor antagonists, or uh, if the IL-6 antagonists are, are not available or for some reason um, contraindicated, then baricitinib would act as the alternative in that. And it's important to highlight that the drug interaction between interleukin-6 receptor antagonists and corticosteroids is additive or synergistic, as in both work together uh, better than each of them separately. And that doesn't mean that both need to be given simultaneously to provide benefits. So, but that's the current recommendations for severe and critical. Then the WHO recommendations strongly against are uh, drugs that uh, we know um, does not work. Um, and the classic two drugs that we 
the WHO guidelines recommend against in all of those t severity states is the is hydroxychloroquine and the lopinavir ritonavir uh, because essentially what you see with those antiviral or putative antiviral therapies is uh, the possibility of harm uh, as opposed to benefit in any shape or form so that's a strong recommendations against then comes to this conditional recommendation group of drugs where you either recommend conditionally for or conditionally against that happens because the evidence uh, that we you highlighted earlier is not conclusive enough to say yes or no so classic uh, conditional recommendation example is the one that um, Stephen highlighted earlier which is um, Ronapri where it doesn't work across the board in the in terms of illness severity and it must not work across different viral variants so you essentially provide a conditional recommendation for severe group conditional on the fact that so for the hospitalized group conditional on the fact that they are not ha omicron infected so that's a kind of the conditional element of it and then the conditional against at this point in time the conditional against recommendation is for um, ivermectin um, and the conditional there being that if you're going to use ivermectin, use it in the context of clinical trials. There is no evidence that it works in patients. If anything, there is evidence probably that it harms. And then the other other kind of surprise conditional against, um, weak conditional recommendation against in severe patients is convalescent plasma because there is no evidence for uh, benefit. So. Um, the reason why it is still there is because some of the trials in subgroups that showed possible benefit. So, so there are trials ongoing trying to understand those uh, subgroup effects for convalescent plasma. Um, so I, probably I should stop there as a brief overview and then we can kind of pick up some of the uh, points. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think um, so two years down the line, I guess what's really uh, come to light is the, the importance of stratification, stratification of risk strat stratification of severity um, and I think Chris that plays out in the trials in the community too doesn't it that the, the idea has never been to blanket treat the whole of the of the community when they have a positive test it's it, it again there's stratification at play there too isn't there yeah and you know to develop uh, the point that Stephen also made you know we started out for example with uh, antibiotics we discovered penicillin was good for treating pneumonia and then we started without trial evidence, giving it to everybody with a cough and then to children with colds. And now we're sitting with a parallel pandemic that few people talk about, and that's the antimicrobial antibiotic resistance pandemic. And, and you know, a million people a year at least are dying from, from that problem. And you know, we, we got to be careful about making the same mistakes uh, here with antivirals. Um, we, we have a precious reservoir, shall we say, of sensitivity to these drugs, to any drug, and overuse could take away from that reservoir to harm us and, and our children. And, and that reservoir of sensitivity doesn't belong to anybody apart from society. It belongs to all of us, not a company not a task force, not a, gui a guideline manufacturing. We've all got to look after it. So um, the, the, the trial that, that I'm leading, the trials that I'm leading, are asking the question about whether who within the sort of higher risk group, but not the very, very high risk group, should be treated. So in the UK, we have COVID medicines delivery units, which uh, people in the very high risk, people with uh, very poor immunity or unvaccinated can get direct access to a range of antiviral treatments. And the large scale panoramic trial, for example, that we're doing is looking at molnupiravir in people who have a risk factor, but not at the severe end of that uh, spectrum. And it's working out who within that group should be treated and you know who for example in primary care coming to their gp should be getting an antiviral and who we can safely manage without okay thank you very much and um uh, and, and what about the availability of, of these drugs are, are they um I, I guess a lot of this is still in the trial setting um, yeah so so the antiviral task Force, the UK government has, has procured uh, substantial amounts of both molnupiravir and um, Paxlovid, 
And, you know, I'm really proud, I think, of, of the task force and, and, and the approach that the UK has taken to this, where we are not just giving those drugs out to everybody who wants them or with a positive test, but we are uh, implementing um, rollout of these drugs within the context of research and clinical trials so we can get the evidence that we need. Because I, I, th I think as people have sort of been hinting at already, we've got pretty small efficacy studies, but we don't know enough about health economics. Um, I think molnupiravir costs 500 pounds for one course. And you can imagine if we gave it to everybody with a positive test, what that might do to the national fiscus. We don't know enough about resistance. And, um, you know, it's just a five-day course, so it may or may not be a problem, but we've got to be sure uh, 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 that we've got enough data to, to make decisions about that. And we don't know whether the um, results of the trials done by the companies uh, under conditions um, uh, before Omicron came out in an unvaccinated population, whether those results will play out uh, in the UK at the current time, uh, say with Omicron in, in a largely vaccinated population. So a very important principle of doing research in the context where you plan to deploy uh, that intervention, because it's not always transferable. Um, the results are not always transferable from different settings, different times and different places. Thanks for that. Stephen, do you, do you want to should we bring you in on, on that point? Yeah, sure. I mean, I completely agree with Chris. I mean, the, <clears throat> the difficulty we have um, as well with with COVID is that it, it it sort of changes in terms of potentially lower risk, lower pathology um, disease, which is mainly viral driven at the beginning, which is why it's so important to get these drugs into people early. Um, we've seen that if we compare the, the early trials of remdesivir mm -hmm. in very severe patients, because their disease has shifted more to a immuno pathology, you know, an immune driven pathology later on, remdesivir is less effective in that setting. So it really is important to get the drugs into the right people and at the right time. So um, getting it in early um, is, is, is really, really imperative in my view, but we do have to be very careful. And it, it sort of puts me in mind, and, and I hate comparing SARS-2 to flu, but actually um, <clears throat> the sorts of therapies that we're, we're looking at in short doses given to maybe fairly small selected populations in, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the general population still does potentially have the capability of driving resistance. And we need to understand more about whether those viruses then, and of course it's not the viruses that then get treated and go away that we worry about, it's the people that don't respond who continue to shed virus. And if that virus is potentially viable, then we need to look at the genetic implications of that and whether those viruses can thrive. And this is why I keep saying we, we, we do need second lines. We need additional direct targeting antivirals if we want to do this in this way. But we also need to ensure that our testing remains reliable because the key here is identifying those patients that test positive early, especially if they're at risk. And for me, I, I think it's, it's a logistic um, question that, that we need to ensure does not get lost as the testing system is dismantled. Yeah, so yeah, but we'll, we'll come back to that because it, it'd be very interesting to know exactly what is being done to monitor the, the evolution of, of the virus in, in that respect and, and mm. under the current conditions. But I, I, I guess um, the other message is we need to be responsive to what's going on and things are changing constantly. Mm. Um, and Manu, I guess that's why your guidelines are, are called living guidelines because you, you update them on, on a regular basis, don't they? How, how, how does that come about? So, um... Uh, it's a WHO guidelines, so it's uh, not mine, but I will, I will kind of try and defend it. I'm one of the many people who joined the group to help. So uh, the way the WHO guidelines work is really complex. Um, so there is a systematic review group uh, based at McMaster and a methodology group um, based at McMaster and at Magic. Um, what they essentially do is to continuously update uh, the meta-analysis based on the evidence that is emerging. And then when there is enough 
of evidence to inform a change in guideline. You reconvene a guideline development group chaired by uh, folk who are independent of clinical trials and independent, in, in, independent of any commercial interest to make sure that it's equitable. Uh, and there are a number of questions that we ask uh, during the guideline development process um, that includes not only evidence, but also the uh, applicability and the global availability of interventions. Sometimes during the guideline development process, um, the, we do what is called as a prospective meta-analysis where a priori uh, it is decided that there is accumulating evidence from trial data uh, but uh, there are some trials that are about to finish and tr some trials that are finished and the classic example which I was involved in was the interleukin-6 um, antagonists where uh, we knew that some early trial data had come with conflicting results we also knew that there are another 10 or 12 trials that are about to complete in the next six months. So what you do is to bring together all the investigators and develop a analysis plan um, agnostic of any of the trial results. Uh, but the goal there is to figure out some common clinically important patient-centered outcomes like mortality um, and then develop a analysis plan to figure out when is the best time to do the meta-analysis and that's kind of the prospective element of the prospective meta-analysis and that's one other element that goes into the guideline uh, development uh, process and um, i think it, there, there is a question if i may if I, uh, there's a question from somebody about d dimer do you want me to address that yes uh, sure yeah yeah <laughs> so essentially the answer uh, that is doc i think camilla kolaku uh, mm -hmm. question is so briefly the answer is there were three platform trials that evaluated that particular question about D-dimer, uh, not D-dimer, coagulopathy in the pathophysiology of COVID and the value of therapeutic dose heparin. Um, just a reminder, I said at the start that the population of patients with COVID admitted to hospital divided into critically ill and the severe patients. Now, critically ill patients, uh, when we start a therapeutic heparin early on in their disease course, in the multi-platform uh, trial, the, there was evidence for harm. So in patients who are critically ill, giving heparin early on doesn't benefit but harms. Whereas in patients who are severely ill, um, there was a signal for uh, benefit. Those two trials have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that was left, le led by uh, investigators from the REMAP-CAP trial, um, attack. Uh, trial um, and ACT for a trial. So those are three platform trials that contributed data in the context of a pandemic. Now, mm -hmm. as an example, here is WHO are putting together a group that will go on to do uh, the prospective uh, meta-analysis and develop guidelines uh, based on the evidence that's out there for that intervention. So as it stands today, that's the answer to your question. The second question is aspirin. The evidence is a bit more uncertain. Um, I would probably say, uh, watch this space. The, there are trials that are, uh, trials of remap cap uh, have shown uh, benefit and uh, the trials, there are other trials that haven't. So that is uncertain uh, to recommend anything at this stage. Thanks. Thank you very much, Manu. Thank you, Camilla, for your questions. Um, so, Chris, the, the emphasis on clinical trials to begin with was very much in, in the hospital setting, wasn't it? But, but the, the, the emphasis has now changed to be much more community based. And I think the response to, to those trials has been uh, phenomenal in respect of the numbers recruited and, and the results being generated. Do you want to talk about um, the, the, the logistics around that and, and it, with your role as co chief investigator on those two? Um, major trials? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's worth noting actually that um, only about 20% of publication, clinical trials published for therapeutics of COVID come from ambulatory patients. And as I say, you know, the challenge is to stop them deteriorating such that they get into a hospital trial. Um, in other words, you know, preventing eligibility for a hospital trial is, is the mission here to some extent. And also getting people back on their feet, taking up caring responsibilities and their work and their usual function as well. So recovery is a very important aspect of um, the uh, outcomes that we'd like to see from, from these community-based trials. Um, now, we, we have not only... Um, uh, set up platform trials that have evaluated quite a, a number of different drugs. 
Um, we've also sort of turned around or turned on its head some of the ways in which we've delivered trials in primary care. So we've changed actually, I, I think it's fair to say the UK has led the world really on the um, large scale platform trials uh, in, in the community. Um, and uh, what, what we do is instead of the old kind of approach where you, you, you got a question, does this drug work? Well, you set up a trial, you compare outcomes with this drug uh, with, with a control group. And when you reach your sample size, you can then uh, look in, in, into your data and see if there's a benefit. The new approach that we're following or a different approach is that trials can be all, uh, sort of analyzed as you're ongoing. And as soon as you hit a signal for futility or benefit, then a committee that is looking at this data in confidence can announce, look, you know, your interim is showing a benefit. So as soon as you start to get a hint of, of benefit, you can start applying that or much, much sooner you can apply that data to, to the real world. So in the principal trial, we've had seven drugs under study. And in the panoramic trial, which in fact started on the 8th of December, uh, and, and we started recruiting into, into this trial at a time of uh, a lot of people being sick, not only in um, the care service, but also within our trials unit, um, coming up to the holiday season. Um, so we start, we recruit first patient on 8th, 8th uh, of December, and, and now we've recruited uh, 12,303 participants. And, um, you know, on some days we've recruited over 400 patients, which is a reflection of, uh, I think, members of the public's desire to share their experience with us as researchers to um, find out who these drugs should be given to. So it, it's, it's probably, I think, the fastest recruiting trial in primary care has tremendous support of, of a therapeutic ever, um, which, which is excellent. And we can recruit through what we call panoramic hubs. These are uh, general practices and affiliated practices around them called spokes. And they, they can recruit their participants, but we also are able to recruit through our website. And this concept of an online trial where somebody can participate in research without actually having to leave their home. And bear in mind, these are people sick with COVID, so that's good. Um, we can, they can register online at panoramictrial.org, fill in their details, uh, if they screen potentially eligible for the trial, one of our clinical team will uh, uh, endeavor to phone them back, talk through the trial. We will courier medicine then directly to their home if they're allocated to receive that medicine. And we'll follow them up over 28 days in that way. So it's a kind of um, uh, uh, addition to the traditional research model where we wait for people to come to where the research is happening. But if the research is not happening at your GP practice, you can't participate. So hence the, the, the panoramic trial is now a truly UK-wide trial, all four devolved administrations. People can participate and uh, regardless of where you receive your health care or regardless of where you, you live. And in that sense, I think we kind of democratize in clinical trial delivery through this mechanism. So Tremendous innovation, I think, uh, in the UK, both in terms of um, the approach to adaptive trials as well as to trial delivery. Absolutely, yes, it's very impressive indeed. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, St Stephen, maybe we'll come on just to talk a bit more then about, um, about how we're monitoring the evolution of the virus. Um, and uh, yes, we, we've changed our testing strategy here in, in the UK and, and, and in England. Um, and how, how is that going to impact the, the, the monitoring? How is the monitoring done? Um, well, the UK HSA maintains constant surveillance in, in collaboration with things like COG UK, um, which is a large consortium um, which are looking at the genetic changes linked with the surveillance um, across the world, which was established for influenza originally for, through GIZAID, GIZAID, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and, and that is basically taking a, a, a sample 
of the PCR tests that are done and sequencing those. So it's usually around, it, well, at the height of, of, of Delta, for example, you're talking about 10, maybe 15% of those sequences were, were looked at. And there's still sentinel sampling of that. It's linked in with the ONS survey as well. What's not clear now though, is how that's going to be maintained, at least to my knowledge, with the scaling down of PCR testing. So you need to think about testing in different ways. The, obviously the, the clinical confirmation of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection needs to be done by, by PCR and that's still going to happen in hospitals. So it may be that we can access surveillance that way. The issue there is that, as we sort of talked about and touched on, by the time people are ending up in hospital, they're already developing severe disease. So we're gonna be behind any kind of difference in, in the evolution of that virus. Um, really, it's down to sentinel testing across the planet to track the movement of these, these, these variants, which we know, you know, for example, we identified Omicron originally um, through working with people in South Africa and their excellent surveillance there. But the UK really has led the world in, in SARS-CoV-2 surveillance and genetics because, you know, we contribute many more sequences to the database than, than, than many other places. And we need to maintain this. Um, it's absolutely essential, especially as if we are going to move into an era where we're trying to treat people early and perhaps that the number of people that will become treated expands and the treatments don't always work. So if you start to see that additional pressure on the viral population, that viral population will start to respond to that. And so much like what Chris mentioned about um, penicillin, it's when you start changing the environment and, and the situation for that virus that the virus will start to change itself back again. Um, this is mainly with respect to the small molecules, antivirals, so things like Paxivid, Momopiravir. Those are the things that are going to start driving the changes in the viral sequences. We already have inherent changes in the viral sequences um, that, that can change the efficacy of the different monoclonal therapies. But by and large, the immune modulatory therapies that we have for treating the severe disease shouldn't really be changing too much because they're affecting us more than they're affecting the virus. So there's less of a, of a concern there in terms of that. But of course, if you have a more virulent strain of the, of the virus, such as Delta, then you're more likely to see more severe disease. So, you know, it, it, it really is a question of this is a very dynamic situation um, across the planet. We need to keep the surveillance going. I would absolutely hope that things like the ONS survey and linked genetic studies through PCR testing will be maintained in the UK because what we really cannot do is blind ourselves to how this virus is changing. It really is important. Are our PCR um, uh, tests going to be, or our results going to be biased towards more severe uh, um, types of of, of, uh, of coronavirus because they're being tested in the hospital setting. Is there some bias there over testing in the hospital versus testing in the community? Um, I think that might happen if, if, if there was a, a, a sort of influx of a new variant, for example, and if we were only testing hospitals, much as what happened in, in March 2020, because the testing was really much restricted to the hospitals, we, we really only understood what was happening once we started getting the testing ramped up. Um, I think now that we have our global surveillance, we'd be able to predict that happening. But of course, we're, we're quite capable of growing our own variants here in the UK, as we saw with Alpha. So um, we need to maintain that surveillance. I, I imagine that the people, generally speaking, so any, any infection outcome is going to be dependent on the host and the virus and the environment. So, for example, if they're on medication. So mainly the people that end up um, in hospital either haven't responded well to their vaccines or couldn't have their vaccine or have under other underlying health conditions. But that's not universally the case. This, this virus is capable of making anybody unwell, which um, again is potentially a, a problem when we are focusing our, our antivirals on, on the most sick and unwell, but that's certainly the way we should start going forwards until we have comprehensive combination therapies that we know are going to be, you know, almost resistance proof from the start. We, we, we really need to try and future plan for this. We, we can't just keep going with single therapeutics forever because I, I, I think this virus has shown us that despite the sort of convention that, that coronaviruses don't change and evolve very much, which isn't true, um, this thing really has a huge change engine 
um, going for it, not least because of the sheer scale of the pandemic across the globe. There are so many billions of viral genomes changing at the moment that it really is a case of the monkeys and the typewriters. You know, we, we, if we start perturbing that uh, evolution in the virus, and of course, this is a, a difficult one to predict because of the nature of the therapies we're applying, but it is conceivable that we could start to drive resistance. And, and we know, for example, that there are clearly defined changes um, driven by remdesivir, but they're generally not particularly fit. But it's a question of time and making sure that if, if patients aren't responding, that we, we, we check to see whether that virus is viable afterwards. Okay, thank you. And, and it sounds as though there's, there's global thinking on this. So it's, it's a mm. collective keeping an eye on things collectively. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's good to know. And one of the things you said, um, Stephen, was about um, the response to um, antibody serum. M Manu, that is a, a major element of your um, treatment strategy, isn't it, in one of your risk groups? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, we've, we've seen with Omicron that we we have to we're really only restricted to the um, to one set of monoclonals. There is the new AZ combination, but again, that that probably the longer lasting one that probably needs to be given at higher doses to combat Omicron. So the, the virus is is changing. The antibodies, whether they're supplied as monoclonals or through our own immune responses, yeah. are targeting similar regions. So when that virus changes, it, it does affect those therapeutics, unfortunately. But one important point to, to, to look at, and, and there are some studies coming out saying that the, the relative neutralization capacity of these therapies is different for different strains. You have to make sure that, that you take into account the actual level of antibodies that are effective in your bloodstream because if the reduction doesn't take it below that, then they will still work, presumably, which is why they've boosted the level for the, the AstraZeneca, for example. Yeah, exactly. So I think I think it's important to, to keep in mind the sort of realities of therapy that, that Manu and, and Chris deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and not get too carried away with some of the changes. But, but certainly we need to be at a place where we know and we can identify which strain of the virus is, is infecting people particularly for the monoclonal antibody therapies, definitely. But yeah, with small molecules going forward, we may be in that situation as well. Yeah. Manu, can I, can I bring you in on that? No, I think I agree with the, all the points that Stephen made. Uh, the, the alternate kind of uh, hypothesis that people try is instead of targeted monoclonals, use convalescent plasma uh, as a polyclonal uh, kind of intervention. And again, the population of patients where it has kind of shown some benefit in the some Argentinian trial is in the pre-hospital uh, slash very uh, mild disease to prevent them from requiring hospitalization. So we are still in that phase of the pandemic where, as you start, rightly stated the introduction, we, we kind of went for the uh, big uh, problems slash big wins that we could get with platform trials. Now we are in that phase of trying to fine-tune interventions for an evolving virus in a vaccinated population with a different baseline risk. So everything that we started off with is not no longer the kind of the target population that we are going to work with. And uh, there are some biological reasons why I kind of say specifically the issue of uh, antibodies vaccinated for patients getting severely unwell. There are some interesting biological questions that could come up um, in that space so uh, yeah great thank you very much and I, I think it's probably time to to bring in our, our audience now um, and uh, as as we uh, thought may happen there have been lots of questions about long covid um so and, and treatment of long covid and, and what we do and what and in what setting um that should be dealt with and um, managed so chris what are your thoughts around treatments for and management for for long covid in, in the community setting I think this is critically important because um, with the novel uh, antivirals that are coming down the line, follow-up has only been quite short in, in, in those trials. And the trials, uh, as is the panoramic trial, the principal trial of acute therapeutic agents, in other words, treatment while you're sick uh, with the acute illness. Now, um, we, we don't have any data from the pharma company trials yet, and I, I don't know if this will come, about what the impact might be on the development of long COVID. 
um, particularly under Omicron, which could be different. So in, in the principal trial, for example, we trialed a, a drug called uh, inhaled budesonide, so asthma, uh, a steroid, um, um, and you know, if why wouldn't it work in a sense in in primary care in the milder end of the spectrum? There's there's good reasons for it, and and we found uh, in our view a benefit for that drug, and it's coming up to about a year now after um, many of these people were in their trial, and so we're going to start analysing whether there's a difference over the years subsequent to their illness of. Uh, c acute COVID as to whether the, the acute treatment that, that we thought there was a benefit from initially carries over into impact on long COVID. And similarly, in our trials of molnupiravir, and uh, we plan to introduce Paxlovid also in the panoramic trial, we'd be looking not only does this benefit people in the short term, but does it um, uh, uh, help in the long term? Now, they the, the, that type of trial is very different. In other words, long-term effects of acute therapeutic agents on long COVID. That type of trial is very different from when people have already got long COVID and you start randomizing them to different treatments. And there are trials like that that have started. But um, to my knowledge, there is no clear trial evidence yet. And, and, and uh, maybe Manu can, can update me on um, interventions that are specific to um, various different phenotypes of long COVID that are proven to benefit um, uh, the, um, the, the, the condition as, as yet. But that, that's another one of the new frontiers in our research effort that, that requires um, uh, more time and more, uh, I think, comprehensive research effort. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I guess one of the issues is we, we don't fully understand the etiology of long COVID and, and, and therefore what we're dealing with to be able to predict it, preempt it and be able to risk stratify it in, in that area, do we? Yeah. Manu? Yeah, so um, great question. This is, uh, this is going to be a challenge for the next uh, few years, I think. This is, if you are unwell and in hospital and you recover, uh, ignoring COVID for a moment, anybody who comes into hospital who is acutely unwell with an infection like pneumonia or any other reason and they recover, they recover with some degree of new morbidity, um, their quality of life is altered. Now, the more severe the disease, the chance of that happening is higher. And in COVID, what we have essentially got is a very a complex problem of patients with mild COVID illness who never got hospitalized have developed this post-COVID condition. And the risk factors for developing that post-COVID condition hasn't been completely understood. The exact mechanism is still unclear. There are two broad hypotheses that people are thinking about. One is that there is a reservoir of the virus somewhere within the body that contributes to the longer term uh, kind of symptomatology. A gut is one of the reservoirs that people have considered. Um, the other is the, um, in some of the acutely unwell COVID patients, you start to see evidence of autoimmunity in the form of autoantibodies. And that kind of suggests that the normal checks and balances of the immune system that exist um, has been altered Due to this infection and one isn't clear whether this acute mild infection without hospitalization could essentially alter in such a way that you start to see some of the uh, sequelae that you would expect to see in hospitalized patients and i think the final point i want to make here is patients uh, with sepsis is a good example who come into hospital and you recover and go back to the community they have residual morbidity and the there are some similarities in all of these post-acute illness conditions, um, and it'll take a long uh, kind of time to unravel. And there's a question in the uh, chat box about when are the clinical trials going to come out? So a lot of the clinical trials of post-COVID condition, I'm trying to avoid the term long COVID, post-COVID conditions are in early phase or rather phase two trials. And, and, the, and, this, and the drug development and 
methodology would expect that the phase two then go on to get confirmed with the phase, T, phase three trial of promising interventions. And I think so, you know, we're looking at kind of fall of 2022 when you kind of uh, get the readout of some of the early phase two uh, trials. And the phase two trial space is further complicated in that trials are targeting on specific aspects of post-COVID condition. For example, there is a trial uh, of um, exertional fatigue in post-COVID condition. That is a population that they're targeting. And there's a trial that targeting purely the respiratory complications following COVID. Um, and there is a trial that targets the quality of life and overall function. So some of the outcomes and the interventions are different between these trials. And it will take a hell of a lot of harmonizing and synthesizing of data to get to something like I come to my GP, I have got post-COVID condition, I get drug X. So it's, 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 it's not going to be quick, it's not going to be easy, um, and it's going to take a bit of time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I just might ask the top voted question, um, uh, initially posed by Martin Russell. Martin, thank you for your question. Um, uh, and it's around, again, the stratification of high-risk patients with access to antivirals. His question is from the perspective of a clinically vulnerable household where one member of the household received a shielding letter, one did not receive a shielding letter, neither vulnerable household members have received the potential priority antiviral letter. What evidence base has been used to stratify access to antivirals? Chris? <laughs> yes, uh, so the um, Department of Health set up an expert panel that identified conditions that they considered um, put people at particularly high risk for, for um, complications from, from, from COVID. And it's, it's, it's a long process, a long list available on, on, on the government website. Exactly, um, um, you know, the, and the evidence base for that is obviously complicated because, um, Doing prospective studies amongst those people, um, you know, there, there was no time to do that. So um, it's it's based on uh, observational retrospective data largely, and the um, issue of why some people in one household got notification and others, uh, unfortunately, I can't comment on implementation and notification uh, within within the health service around that. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I, I, I wonder, Lita, if I, if I could just sort of make a quick supplementary comment about this, because quite a lot has come up in the um, chat about planning ahead. And um, I suppose that is also prospective identification of people at higher risk. And just to mention, you know, looking back on history, when the swine flu pandemic was around, we had the H1N1 pandemic, and, and we, we gave people drugs irrespective of risk profile. Um, well, we gave them oseltamivir or Tamiflu, and we didn't randomize a single person in um, the UK and, in fact, in the world, in the community which I, I regard as an, an international disgrace, really. And, and that drug remains one of the most contested drugs in the world. And is probably, you know, it, it's not used much uh, because of an incomplete evidence base. And we could have got that evidence base if we had done what we are doing now. Um, in, in this pandemic, where quite quickly we've set up trials, incredibly quickly, really, and, and started to randomize people. But we could do that even quicker if we had that standing infrastructure um, so that uh, we, we hit the ground running with trials already established, all the mechanisms and the complicated apparatus we need uh, with all the, the outcome measures and so forth ready so that in the event of within this pandemic, new variants emerging, uh, things changing, we can quickly do the trials and then identify those risk groups prospectively and also at the same time be identifying whether the treatments that are available work for them and do what we hope we're doing. Because in fact, with some of those risk groups right now, they're getting direct access to treatment, but the evidence that that treatment will definitely help them is incomplete in many cases. 
So I think that kind of pandemic preparedness is something we, we, we're getting much better at, but it's a plea, I guess, for um, uh, society to, to keep hold of the infrastructure that we've, we've battled to develop um, uh, and, and, you know, we've, we've sweated blood to, 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 to set up these incredible studies to answer those very questions around, well, who are the high-risk groups and what treatments work best for them? And we need uh, a seamless trial capability from early treatment in the community through to hospital care, through to the ICU, which I think we are developing, but that needs to be integrated better. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and the, the 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 setup of trials and the and the running of trials and the delivery of trials has been absolutely uh, phenomenal in respect of how how quickly things have been operationalised. And I work in rare diseases, and I can tell you, I'm very envious uh, of what's happened in in this era. Um, so, uh, but 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 Asati Saw has has put lots of questions up. Thank you, Asati, for all your questions. I'm going to ask this one though. Um, I think Asati thinks it's not it's not happening quick enough. Uh, since uh, clinical trials take a long time for an outcome to be achieved, she says, are there any considerations for immunoinformatics in reducing the time lapse of clinical trials for quicker availability of diagnostics and therapeutics? So I think you're asking about some kind of uh, surrogate biomarker maybe for, for, for success in, um, in these clinical trials. Manu, is that something you can speak to? Yeah, no, I can start. I'm sure the uh, mm -hmm. rest of the panel members would gladly chip in here uh, and probably agree with me. So um, if you look at uh, clinical trials um, of having an intermediate outcome or a surrogate outcome, um, it often is an early phase clinical trial. What you're looking for there is a biological signal for an intervention. And let's, for argument's sake, that we were to do a trial of corticosteroids in COVID-19, and instead of the mortality outcome, you say, I want to look at IL-6 levels or CRP levels. And you would see that anti-inflammatory effect. But what you need for patients uh, to get better is with these intervention, having an effect on clinically important outcomes such as mortality. So the trial that you need to do there is go back to the same patient population and say, hey, I have got a surrogate that shows some benefit and therefore I want to go, go and do a larger trial. So, um, and to now directly address the question of immunoinformatics, part of my um, research is uh, precision immunology in critically ill patients. So although I would love to stand here and uh, say that that is exactly what we should do. Uh, sadly, I'm not going to do that because there are so many causal pathways between a biological signal to a clinical outcome that may or may not be modifiable. That's one. Two, immunology is replete with redundancies within the system where if you block one element of a pathway, you, you can overcome that resistance biologically. And three, some of the risk that patients get is non-modifiable, as in you have the impact of age, you have the impact of comorbidity, you have the impact of a polymorphism that they may have that is not immediately remediable with a global trial that you're trying to do. And the last point about subgroup analysis and uh, uh, flying the subgroup analysis flag, all the subgroup analysis tells you is that on average, in this patient population that we have randomized, there is a subset of patients where the treatment effect may look different. And we have to then, as trialists, go and do the trial to prove that treatment effect in that subpopulation. There is very limited value in identifying that subpopulation of the ones to treat going forward because the whole of medical literature is replete with trials doing exactly that and harming patients. So, in summary, I would say immunoinformatics, fantastic, essential to do. It gives you few things. One, it identifies drug targets. It identifies subpopulations of interest. It identifies redundancies in the pathways that you can account for when you design your clinical trial and perhaps some element of biomarker to stratify. And the risk is both modifiable and non-modifiable. And the risk that we talk about is risk of getting the disease and risk of outcomes from the disease. And many a times people conflate the two things, they are different. Just because you get the disease doesn't mean that you will have a bad outcome from the disease. And I think there are a few elements of it that needs to go in before 
immunoinformatics, precision medicine, etc., would come into any form of uh, mainstream trial design. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for explaining that. Um, I think I might move on now to a, uh, a, another topical area, a, 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 a question posed by Trian Mahescu. I hope I've said your name correctly. Uh, Trian says, does the acute influx of Ukrainian immigrants deserve a special testing politic? I think he means a special testing strategy. I'm not sure. But I, I don't know. Stephen, have you had any thoughts on... Um, on the, the, the impact of uh, refugees in, in the current situation and um, variants? I, I, I believe that Omicron is, is, is dominant there anyway. So um, surveillance is, is, is about predicting the, the, the difference in, in how the virus is changing. And rather than people coming in, if they were coming in from an area that had completely different viral variants so you know maybe a year or two ago if they're maybe coming over from, from south america for example or south africa and um, then that would have been a very different sort of virus to to the sorts that we have here in the uk um my concern actually is not i mean we have so much virus in this country anyway that to make an impact the the the, the ukrainians coming over will, 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 uh, that just won't it'll be a drop in the ocean um, my major my major concern there is actually for the people still in Ukraine who are being forced into aircraft shelters and and barracks and and into really bad living conditions through this act of recklessness and, and violence. And my concern would be that COVID will be um, kickstarted again in that situation, and that they're not going to be able to get the sort of care that they need, and that could be a secondary health crisis on top of what's already happening. Absolutely, thank you. Um, that there's a question that is um, related to, to shop floor stuff that I'm going to ask Chris. Um, Shadia um, has asked, what do we need to be aware of in primary care in terms of what we can really give? Yeah, so at, at the moment, GPs are not entitled to um, prescribe any specific antiviral, but they can refer people to COVID medicines delivery units for direct access to molnupiravir, favib, um, uh, Paxlovid, and, and monoclonals. Um, so, uh, and then they can give therapy, you know, a, a symptomatic treatment. Um, principal trial. Uh, identified inhaled budesonide as something that you know we feel helped people, um, but there was controversy in Nice about recommending that over patient-reported outcomes, and that really goes back to um, what what Manu was saying. You know, when we try and focus too much on biomedical outcomes in pragmatic research, of course, in efficacy studies. You need those surrogated biomedical outcomes, but but you don't want to land up in the situation where you say the operation was a great success, but the patient died. Ultimately, we need to know, does it make the patient feel better, recover quicker, stay out of hospital? And so uh, interventions with that kind of patient reported outcome, pragmatic evidence are still um, required. And at the moment, we don't have anything that is recommended or licensed for use directly by GPs in primary care. But of course, there are many symptomatic treatments for all the manifestations that have come up in the chat around, around COVID. Okay. Um, well, that's great. I think um, that we have pretty much uh, come to the end now. There are a few questions that we haven't had chance to answer. A number around uh, the cognitive dysfunction in long COVID, the, the, the so-called brain fog. And I think uh, the RSM has this on its radar for to make it its very own um, uh, uh, webinar uh, at some later date. Um, and I hope that some of the other questions have, have been answered in the course of the, of the webinar. Isatu, in particular yours, a special mention, I think should go to Nicholas Page, who is admirably joining us from Australia. So thank you for your question. I hope it's been answered in the, in the course of the, of the webinar. So, uh, well, that leaves me to say uh, thank you very much to our panelists today, to Professor Chris Butler, to Professor Manu Shankar Hari, and to Dr. Stephen Griffin. 
Um, thank you to you all for, for joining and, and for listening in. Um, just before you go, um, get your pens out for your diaries. Um, so another plug for the COVID conference two years on with Professor Sir Chris Whitty and Professor Sir Jonathan Van Tam. That's on the 31st of March. And also another very interesting um, and um, fascinating topic, which um, we, we, we'd like to discuss here at the RSM, and that's on assisted dying, the practicalities of assisted dying. That's going to be a three hour program on the 17th of March. So please do check out that program. It's going to be very interesting and fascinating. Um, so on that note, um, I will say goodbye to you and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you.